Yes. Hello, right. everyone. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. So try, try to. We've got one more hour of lectures before you guys can start doing some coding and some problems. So I'm going to finish off what I was speaking about earlier this morning. So we have. I was speaking about canonical phase estimation in the last. In the last. Um, set of lectures that was a very very expensive method okay so that that was kind of the recipe that was has, was devised by some of like the original people who worked in quantum computing but there's been a lot of working phase estimation since and there's been a few modern kind of advancements in the past year actually and i'm going to speak about that um today so particularly the one by lin lin in this and he's found an optimum, like a phase estimation, which allows you to work in the Heisenberg limit for scaling for error. Um, but it's significantly cheaper, and in my opinion, much more intuitive than the kind of kind of phase estimation. So, going back to phase estimation, remember when it acts on an eigenstate, your time motion operator, you get this perfect spiral in the real imaginary space with time, as you can see with this plot. The and you, and you can see that like the the propagation is defined by the, the phase. But then when you well obviously when you have these competing eigenstates, if you have a, a linear combination, if you have a linear combination of eigenstates, you, you have this kind of different competing weightings of phases, and you end up with this spiral here. And this, this is quite difficult. And like how to extract information out of this. So it's quite a difficult problem. But it turns out that we have this quantum uh, this quantum exponential least squares problem, which is this really simple idea devised by Lin Lin, which essentially said that says, what if we take the Zn, which is your transition state, transition matrix element, which is e to the i h. N tau, where tau is a time slice of propagation we're trying to look at, then, then you can then then they say what, and then then that gives you you sample that for different towers and you get this you get these these blue dots on this graph and that gives you your data points. You say, what if we can fit that with some kind of quite simple exponential function here? So you've got this one so like. Two parameter exponential function where you have the R, which is the kind of the, the magnitude of the exponential, and then the uh, this I theta and T. So N and tau are fixed. It's only R and theta, which you need to worry about. Okay, it's a pretty simple idea. And it's, it's makes sense. So basically, you have you have all these data points set N, and then you're trying to fit that with one um, R E I theta and n tau. And you can see that if by doing this over all the points n and trying to make this as close to zero close to zero as possible, you can say that your 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 function n r e to the i theta n tau is equivalent to the the time evolution uh, transition matrix element. Okay. And then once we have that you can then estimate the phase because you can like re replicate this perfect spiral basically. So the, the aim is to replicate this perfect spiral. And there's some quite nice revelations to come from this, thinking about this. And as we said before, calculating the, the, this transition matrix term in e to the i h n tau, this is quite simple thing, simple in terms of competitive canonical phase estimation object to, to evaluate. So you have, you basically have this Hadamard test for these different time periods t to the n here. And then you can calculate the real part, just put a normal Hadamard test, and you get the imaginary part by adding the phase gate where it's w gate So you just do this for a slightly different length times with your chosen method of time evolution. You can use Trotter, you can use truncated Taylor series, you can use um, quantum signal processing. Uh, whatever, but essentially you have this simple single ancilla uh, 
uh, circuit, which gives you the expectation value. So getting the ZM is done by the circuit, quite simple. Now, it turns out that you can actually do some quite simple differentiation to make the problem even simpler. So if you keep the fix the value of theta and, and then vary R for minimization of L, you end up with this function, essentially. And then this, you have to work through this. The, the paper is referenced in a second, but you basically get, you can then substitute this back into the original equation. And you end up with this function, which is which is this minimum. So you end up with this new this new form of the loss function when you substitute, substituted this, and you basically removed R from the problem. So now you have got your problem defined completely in terms of theta. And basically, because this function is so simple, you can see that. Minimizing this is just maximizing this function here on the right hand side. So, that, so now you just need to build Zm e to the i theta n to tau. And Z, Zn, Zn is calculated from obviously your quantum computing me measurements. And e to the e to n tau is just now this parameter, this one parameter function. So you can see here by taking in your, your data input, data input. Zn, which is your quantum computing measurements, and then and then just scanning over the theta parameter, you can see you get maximums exactly where the eigenvalues of the phase are. So you've got this. So, so you can see here in in this equation. So for smooth, so you can you can see the longer time that you propagate for the the uh, the more resolution you get in the peaks, but you can see the peaks are re relatively in the same place. So this is complete. This completely avoids doing with like the quantum Fourier transform and having to do phase kickback. You're just getting the phase from the transition matrix element, and then do some really clever post processing with the data. So th this is one of the use cases that the students will want to do over the hackathon. But it's pretty cool. So you, it's you just it just requires measurements and then it's all just the post processing method to calculate the the eigenvalues. So, so it's satisfied this method satisfied the Heisenberg limit. And then so you, you obviously need quite a good eigenstate, initial eigenstate. So you have you need to have the, the paper that says that you're 0.71, greater than 0.71 over that to get to be able to use repeat and still success. But then, then if it's below that, you can still use some filtering and signal processing methods to extract the eigenvalues. So everything's formally proved in this paper by the then. But I would say this is really the cutting edge of phase estimation at the moment. So, so this is where you should really start, I think. Okay. So we've spoken a lot about time evolution. In the previous um, in the previous lectures, so now I'm going to dive a bit deeper into time evolution now, and this is kind of fault tolerant um, approach. Uh, I'm not going to talk about variation of time evolution. I'm just going to talk about the algorithms which come under the, the umbrella of Hamiltonian simulation. So, that, so that typically in this field, you see by people like Nathan Meebe, Lin Lin, Ryan Babbage, those guys there, and and Don Berry, like they really heavily work in complexity theory. So they work from a top down approach where they're trying to think about asymptotic complexity, et cetera. But it, it does help to think about this and also from the bottom up. So, how do we build the circuit structure run this rather than investigating complexity? And that's basically what I'm going to show you today is like how you, how would you actually implement these fault tolerant algorithms on a quantum computer? If we had a good enough quantum computer. So, so rather than using an oracular picture, which what I mean is like here's a box that does a time evolution, it's like here is a time evolution box. I could run this with Pi ticket if I wanted to. So there's a number of different ways to do this. You have the famous three are uh, trotterization, which uses the same number of qubits for your states. 
And then you can do time evolution by LCU, which is essentially you, trunc you do a Taylor, Taylor series dispatch and then truncate it, and then it's truncated Taylor series. LCU stands for linear combination of unit trees. You'll find out later in a bit. And then there's also the quantum singular value transform, which allows you to do, which is apparently is the most optimal in the asymptotic limit, but there's still a lot of downsides. So it, it, the game is still out as to like in the, whatever regime you have, whether you should trot a LCU or QSP. QSPT, I should say. And it's very system dependent. So, like, depending on sparsity or Hamiltonian, trotterization might be better if you know sparsity, yeah, et cetera. Okay, so what is trotterization? So, I apologize, this is quite a dense slide. But we, trotterization, you have this time evolution in unitary, right? It's this, you think of it as an integral over time, it's the, uh, the integral of the Hamiltonian over time. But we know that time evolution can be implemented as a unitary. We've already seen that. So you can think about this as kind of an infinite number of this integral can be filled with into infinite products of slices with infinitely small depth. But then you can think about discretizing this. As you can think about discretizing this into a finite number of steps. And this is kind of, and then obviously with if you want to. You want better resolution, you want smaller, smaller steps. So you can think about this as kind of, I call trotterization the sledgehammer because it's just the, it's the simpler, you just slice up your Hamiltonian and, and into tiny steps. And it's really nice to test algorithms because it's so straightforward. But, but the basic thing is this you end up, you, so you go from this theoretical unitary time evolution into some, some of the unitary you know because you can implement the trotter steps directly. But obviously, because of because we're now doing products of trotter steps, products of these A B trees, like these slices, this is not the same as the summation of them. So, so there is a trotter error. There's lots of theory, lots of work into the error of trotter, like studying trotter error, brand trials, for example. I'm going to go deep into the algorithm algorithms literature. Okay, so we've already seen that we can take our fermionic Hamiltonian and then we can turn it into a, a weighted linear combination of linear, weighted linear combination of unitary powers. Okay, so that's so we take, we've done a Jordan Bigger Trust, and now we've got this set of powers with the weightings. So here's an example. Now, if we take, we, if you want to, we can then take this linear combination of powers. And then we can trotterize that for a given time slice. And you can see here, we now exponentiated each term and we've propagated it by this time tau. So it's very important. So we've added this extra, we've exponentiated it with a minus i, and then we've got the tau. Okay. Now, this, as we saw in the previous lecture, we know we now have to do this with the circuit. This is the powder gadget. Okay, so. Our friend is back. Um, so here we have, so, and you can do this in PyTicket by just pallet Xbox. So it's, it's abstracted away very nicely. Well, the coding exercise is actually to do this. Um, so you can see here, again, we have this internal e to the i, theta over two, z, 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 z. And then we have a basis change in each qubit depending on what the power is. So we here we have e to the i minus i theta over two z naught x one x two y three. So we've got change into the x basis with the Hadamard and a change into the y with the rx, and we change it back. So it's thinking about these terms of these similarity transforms with a basis change on each side, then you're in the middle. That you get, a, you can get a, a lot of ground with some of these, this that idea, and this, you'll see this again later on in the lecture. But it extrapolates to much larger abstractions too. Um, okay, so so now we've got this pally gadget. We can we can just we can just so I, I should say this this example is not good because these these circuits do not correspond to this Hamiltonian, but you can get the idea. So say, say, so this is, 
So you've got two exponentiators. A power loop gadget. And so, so this kind of mathematical structure just ends up being this, this circuit stuff. So, and then this, the theta here is related to two H A theta. Because remember, there's a pi over two factor in here. So there's, the, there's, a, there's a factor of half in here. So you just basically chain together all these power gadgets and then you slice them up depending on the time slice and then concatenate them all together and you get your time evolution. So that's why Trotter is so nice in that you don't need any extra ancillas in, and you don't need to do block encodings or anything fancy like that. It's just a brute force sledgehammer. And it's also really easy to implement with SciPy. So you can just exponentiate the matrices and then directly play with them there, which is also an exercise for you to do this, this, this afternoon. Okay. So moving on to linear combination of unitary. So as we've seen in quantum chemistry applications, you, your Hamiltonian always will be given to you in a linear combination of unitaries after your Jordan Finger transform. Um, so you can see, as again, we have this structure where now summation over A and then PA can be quadratic or quartic terms or whatever you want. It's a power word. Typically, though, as we saw in the VQE lecture, normally you have to work, you can only measure the power leads directly on the quantum computer by operator averaging. Uh, or, or at best in commuting sets. But linear combination of unitaries, oh, sorry. So, yeah, linear combination of unitaries allows you to basically manipulate the whole operator as a, as a matrix. It's a way of getting an operator into a circuit and then manipulating it. That's how I like to think about it. So you don't need to like loop over all the terms you just get this big operator as you would in the, in the linear algebra setting. So it's direct, direct manipulation of the circuit H at the, of the operator H and we'll say the Hamiltonian at the circuit level. And it also gives you the access to do, well, you can actually do these brackets as one, one circuit rather than having to loop over all the power term. That's really powerful and it allows you, it's a stepping stone for many other algorithms, such as quantum signal processing, which allows you can do functions of these matrices, etc. So it's summary of this, like more of the story, L LCU gets an operator into the circuit. And I get the whole thing to play with. And it's often called a blocking coding strategy, because you'll see in a second. So let's take the simplest. Um, linear comment. Let's take a sim simplest example. Okay, so say we've got a two term linear combination of unitaries, one way other, alpha x minus beta y. And for simplicity, alpha squared plus beta squared equals one. Okay. Um, so this, this can be, so we can, we can actually access, we can apply this whole operator to the circuit. With this, the hook to the, to, the, to the sedate side with this circuit, and I'll, I'll break it down for you. Ooh. Okay, so, <laughs> so the, we, what we have is, is we have this register at the top, it's called the prepare register. Okay, and the prepare register contains the weightings of each Hamiltonian term as a vector. Okay, so you can think about it as the, the first row of this Ry contains the, the coefficients alpha and beta. And it just so happens that because alpha squared plus beta squared equals one, they can be encoded directly as an Ry matrix. So you can see here now we've got square root of alpha minus square root of beta is at this stage. We haven't touched the side register yet, but the pair register in that superposition. Uh, 
And then we can selectively apply our operators x and y to their corresponding bit strings. Okay, so, so this is really the core of the LCD method. It's like you can see that we've got the coefficient, and then now we're doing a control zero to, to apply the x to the right to the right coefficient. Same with the r y. So it's same with the control y. We have minus uh, square root of beta on the one. We're just going to then we apply the y to its corresponding bit string, the corresponding coefficient with the controlled one r y. Okay. So that's pretty cool. You can start to see how the method's working. It's very simple, but like it, it can do a lot with this. Now we we have now in order to get get this information out of the circuit, we have to rotate back onto the zero register. So that's why it's a square root, because you by rotating into it and then rotating out of it back onto zero, you times it by square root of alpha and square root of beta twice. So you get alpha. So now you can see we've got on the zero register, zero x psi. Yeah, so you can see we've selected, we, we've now we've applied the, the coefficients to our psi. And then we can extract it by measuring on, on the zero state. So you can see these probably should be magnitude squared. But, yeah. Um, so you can see by orthogonality, then this gets to one, and then we just get this nice application of the original operator tip to side. So you can do this for like very, very large matrices. No. Um, so th this is the, this is the LCD method. It's it's very simple. Uh, if people, it's often used in complexity papers, but but it's it's actually quite a simple method, and I don't think many people think about it from the bottom up, really. Okay, so the generalized form is a bit more complicated, but not not much. It's the same idea. You have a pair step, a, a, a select step, and a repair step. So we again we have this weighted sum of parallels. but now we have to do a bit so a bit more technical, which is essentially we have to rescale. Our, we the, all, all the terms in the, all the terms in the Hamiltonian, we add them up to get this. This this is the Euclidean norm, and then we just rescale all of our our, our operator by this, and that's because obviously the reason why we need to do this is the Euclidean norm has a bound that says it will always mean that this U L C U, it will always mean that this H can fit inside a large unit unitary. I can show you the proof for this if you want later, but the main idea is that we've got this larger ULCU, which is this big circuit unitary, and we're embedding our Hamiltonian as a block into the top left corner of it. Okay. And the top left corner is, we did, like in the previous example where we had zero, we just are on one qubit on the zero state. Now we have a register of zero. Okay. And the zero, zero, zero state corresponds to the block that our Hamiltonian has been encoded into. So it's, and then you, you, you don't really care about the rest of the block. You you allow for this to be a non-unitary thing by letting the rest of the block account for that because the total circuit unitary is obviously unitary. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's open, this opens the door, the door to like proper quantum linear algebra, basically. So here's, the, here's what we call this Oracle framework. You might have seen this in some, some papers. So we, what we call the, we have a prepare step, which, which prepares all the bit string, so the, the Hamilton coefficients, the weightings. And then we selectively apply the parallels to the coefficients with a select Oracle. And then we unprepare, it's a pair dagger. And then we, then we post-select into the zero on, on, and filter on the zero shots which projects us back into the block of the larger matrix. And then that applies H. This should be rescaled, so it's H over to, to Psi. So I'll talk you through this again. So, and then, yeah, so that's what this is kind of representing. This notation is just 
projecting into the block of that of that energy. Yeah. And we often see like this, like prepare, select, prepare. Okay, so in the general case, say we've got a long linear combination of weighted power loops. Um, remember, we have to rescale everything. So we rescale the coefficients by the Euclidean norm, just so that we're, in, we're sure that the blocking code matrix will fit inside the larger unit tree. And then you can see we basically we take, say, say, say this parallel linear combination of parallels has H0, H1, H2, H3, etc. We encode each one of those into a unique bit stream on the prepare register. Uh, so we got 000 for H0, 001 for H1, etc. So we're storing the coefficients of the weightings of the Pauli, the weightings of the Pauli as, as a vector, basically. And it's the first, it's the first column in this. We start in the zero and we just encode it into this state. And you can think about if this prepare is a unit tree, it's the first column of the prepare register. So it's a state preparation algorithm where the state repair contains the coefficients of the Hamiltonian term. Okay. This, yeah, and then so typically the, the kind of the brute force way to do this is this serial kind of multi-control way, which so there's a lot of work into improving the prepare states. So you can see here by doing these successive alpha rotations R Y, we can prepare this real vector by doing these kind of selectively multi-control rotations. So they're basically what I'm trying to say here is that there's a guaranteed way to get this vector if you use this circuit, but then there may be better, more efficient ways to do this. And there's even very fault tolerant approaches for state preparation, such as Q, Q ROM, et cetera, things like that, if you want to get into that. But you can actually, that you couldn't do in PyTicket, whereas this you can actually do in PyTicket. So. Um, <coughs> Okay, and then one thing I should say, the if we have negative or complex weightings in our, in our Hamiltonian, that can be absorbed into the select part. We don't need to worry about that in this, in the compare part. Okay, so now we've got, now we've got our prepare state, we've got the coefficients of the Hamiltonian stored as a vector in this P, in this P state coming in. Where each element of the vector is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, et cetera. We then selectively apply the corresponding powers to their coefficients via the controlled power operation, multi controlled power operation, where the multi control is indexed on the vector of the pair register, which the coefficient belongs to. So you can see here, we're like this, this 0, 0, 0 P0 is applying this P0 to this bit string, which contains. This coefficient. Okay. This looks a bit scary, but I think multi controls are there's lots of work being done to reduce the cost of multi controls. And I, I do personally think it's a evil that we can't really get away from. So, and we, yeah, we, they're a necessary evil, I think. Um, <coughs> I mean, you, you could obviously always decompile this down to two and single cubic gates, et cetera. But for algorithmic development, it's, worse. it's much more simple to think about things in terms of multi controls. Okay, so now we've got this, you can see where this is going. So we've, we've got our coefficients applied to our powerless. But now we need to get, get this information out of the circuit somehow. Oh, sorry, we need to kind of. We need to unprepare the state. Actually, I should say, yeah. So, there's a, if what if we if we look at this, the, the Pauli select this this uh, this oracle box, how one would actually do this? There's a there's a serial construction which is kind of a naive way where you just apply the multi control. So, say if we have uh, a Z two Y one X naught, we could just apply them in serial like this. That's fine, and then. 
but you've got, you've got three sets of multi controls there, so you, that's not good. Uh, but PyTigger can do this. So if you basically made a circuit with a, with a, with a Z, a Y, and an X, and a three qubits thing, and they, they made a box of that, if you then went to do a two control box, it will generate this circuit view. And I'll probably optimize it a bit more as well. But there's a slightly more efficient way of doing that, which is using the power gadgets, which our friend is back for the third time today. So to take this simple three cube example, we can, we can implement this control, multi-controlled unit tree in a very efficient way using power gadgets. So we have this, and again, we have this with the ZZZ in the center, but now there's no rotation, right? This is just the, the multi multi qubit par parity operation. <clears throat> and then we can, as before, just do the basis rotation on each side to get the power leader to Z2, Y1, X0. Now this looks more looks more expensive than doing a, a simple Z. What, Z2, Y1, X0. Like you can do that actually with power on the circuits. But the, the reason for doing this is they allow us to compile a really efficient way of doing the multi control. So you have this. Guys, please be quiet. So, um, so, so we have this similar. If you as you can, if you can spot these what I call these similarity transform structures in your circuit, you can often make a big savings if you're doing multi-control or control operations. So here you've got this GUG structure, this similarity transform. And essentially, because you have this self, this property where if there was no U, this would be just an identity. You can just control what's in the U, and then that will control the whole thing. So this is a big saving. So you can apply that logic and you get, so you can, now we can just multi-control on the Z, okay? So th this is the same way that you, even with trot trotterization has a structure as well. You can do control trotterization very efficiently this way too. But here we're using it for control select operations. So, so now we've reduced the, the multi-control factors by like by a third, which is pretty good. Um, We've got a paper coming out on this soon. Yeah, so anyway, now we need to unprepare. So we've got the final, we've got the, the controlled. So we, we have this, we have the prepare register, which is had the, off, the power is applied to, to the state register. We then unprepare and the unprepare rotates everything back onto the zero state. So, you can see you've got H0 and it also times it by its coefficient again. So you can remove the square root. And you can see we've got H0, 0, 0, P0, Psi, H1, renormalize 0, 0, P1. And then what you do is by, you, by measuring here, these should probably be taken out because this is, this is not an operator, it's just a coefficient. But if you, you can see that this, through, through orthogonality, these just go to one times the coefficient. So you now you apply every single power by doing this post selection, you ap apply your all the power leads to their corresponding um, coefficients, and then you also apply it to the state as well. So now you can implement this H side here. Um, and this should be renormalized, I apologize. There should be a H under here as well. Now you may notice that we're doing post selection here. So the, the big downfall of LCU is that you have this success probability. And the success probability is really important for doing the complexity analysis at the level of average. But also the pra practicality, if you have something, if basically this, this function tells you how many times you'll get zero, zero when you do your post selection on the prepare register. And it's basically a function of how unitary, unitary H is. Um, and also the normalization factor here. So you want H to be quite large if you can. You want the Euclidean norm to be close to one. Okay. So there's load, most of the work doing LCD at the moment by people like 
our, our tour is, is my life. People, uh, they think we've been, is like ch playing with the operator, try and get it to be more, to have to reduce this, to improve the success probability, but still give you the properties that you want. So that's the game with us, is in, in, improve the success probability. Okay, so now, now we have, but just to show you some, some how you can play with LCU. So we, now we can do ha these Braquette Hadamard tests, but rather than just take the single powers, we can take operate, we can take expectation values of the whole operator, like you would do in the algebra, which is, so you can see here, we, we can just simultaneously measure the whole operator with what's called the generalized Hadamard test. So this is the Hadamard test, but now we have this, extra prepare register here and this prepare register encodes that allows us to do the block encoding and basically gives us this whole operator rather than so you can it basically allows you to implement this identity this is very cool now you can do this with you can combine this with vqe if you wanted to and um, because remember i said in the last lecture that the success probability of Sorry, the, the number of measurements with the Pauli terms in your jordan bigger transform for operator averaging in the in traditional BQE can be a killer because you get n to the four measurements. This does n to the four measurements in one measurement. The problem is that you again have this success probability here. So there is a trade-off. It's not it's not magic. Um, but the you may have heard of Grover's algorithm, amplification. You can apply this with successive reflections on this repair register, and that will boost the probability. That's, uh, I mean, that's, if anyone's up for a challenge, but try that. I have research project on this. Okay. So finally, well, how long are we going? Let me just check the time. Okay. So. Quantum signal processing. This is this magical new algorithm that's come around. It was originally devised 2016 was when the archive paper came out. But I think 2019 is when the peer review version came out. But I was trying a good cow low. So quantum signal processing is a really cool algorithm. And it's it's part of this, well, it was the foundation of this framework for the grand unification of quantum algorithms paper that came out by the trying, I think last year now. But it, it, allows you to, it allows you to show, by using this, these ideas, you can unify all the arguments under one framework, which is very cool. I'm trying to explain that now. So if you think about just a signal rotation, we can treat the, the zero input with a zero measurement as, as, as this operation, right? So you're just doing it. This, they've got the cosine squared of this element here. Now, if you were to plot this, we're just measuring the zero. You can see it's just this, it's, co it's just co it's cosine square function, right? P pretty, pretty standard. But it turns out when they were, they were looking into this, they were thinking how, how much information can we store on a single qubit? Okay. And it actually turns out from composite pulse sequence theory. So I just try and <laughs> had an insight on this because he was originally an NMR electrical engineer, which it's like all built around composite pulse theory. But then they, they apply that to qubits, which is genius, because it's still SU2 subgroups. So SU2 symmetries. Well, basically, what, what they showed is that if you interleave these, these RZs with, with the original signal rotation, which is cosine function, you can manipulate the cosine function however you want. Okay. So here's an example where I just, you just give a random set of these into these phi, RZ phi rotations. And you can see that now what was our nice cosine has become this crazy function, okay, with loads of information. And, and, and what I'm trying to show here is not that this is useful, but it's like you can really do a lot with a single keyword. Now it turns out that these phi's can actually be encoded to make any function, right? It's kind of well up to some caveats, such as it has to be between minus one and one on the x. 
so on the Y. And that has definite parity. But you can see here we've applied the same idea with this with this original cosine or R, R, Rx, and then we've manipulated it with a known we've got we now you can generate the phi's, there's algorithms to do that. It's a classical problem from signal processing. And it's quite the Romer's exchange algorithm or something like that. But you can basically now you can implement this is just a sing, single qubit here, so we're still measuring on the zero zero the zero zero element. But you can see now we I, we've you can optimize you can basically treat this as the best fit line and optimize the parameters however you want for a given function. So we hit here, I think this is cosine five x or something. Um, and we've implemented this function on a single qubit. So it turns out there's this 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 uh, theorem. <coughs> That shows we can implement any Chebyshev polynomial of cosine theta using this this framework, and obviously the Chebyshev polynomials are very versatile. They can be just the basis for for most functions. I think, yeah. Okay, so P, P A is this product of sines and cosines. Uh, sorry, this product of phases and cosines, etc. Okay, so you can it basically generates any function p a, given the the some caveats such as definite parity and the immutability one and minus one of of the original input. Okay, so this you've got this. It's just a it's just a single qubit constant processing is just generating a function, but the by and by measuring on the zero zero element. Uh, you can implement whatever function you want on the original input data. Now, this can be used for. Now we can apply this to the. We can combine this with the block encoding technique that we used in just that just arrived. Now every matrix has its own SVD, right? There's all, that one matrix can always be decomposed as an SVD where you have a YouTube matrix. Scaling and then another YouTube rotation matrix. And then, but think about it when we block encode the matrix, we also have this implicit SVD, but now this is living in the circuit. Okay. Right. So th this is pretty cool. And the, the scaling factors, the S, the diagonal S matrix, they can be manipulated just in the same way as how matrix function is done classically. Where we apply the matrix function to the singular values, but instead we apply the matrix function to the singular values directly at the circuit level using the quantum signal processing mentality, because the quantum signal processing mentality allows you to implement functions on the circuit. Okay, so that that's the really powerful um, revelation with this. And the circuit's quite complicated, but it's it's it kind of it's like it does kind of make sense. So if you so rather than have before you had this RZ RX RZ RX, whereas now because we're playing with matrices, not just functions, we we want to what we do is we have to get the singular values onto this single processing qubit. So we, we do the block, typical block encoding, which gets our H, the matrix of interest, into the circuit. We know that this is in the zero zero block of this. So this this these two qubits implement the ULCU circuit. Okay, as you can see here. We can then pick out that block by doing the multi-control. Because we know this isn't on the zero zero basis. Now this we can then pick out this block using the the zero zero. So this 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 I mean this equals a zero 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 multi control, and then that controls this matrix and projects it onto the signal processing qubit. Now because we projected the matrix onto the signal processing qubit, and then we're doing this diagonal, so this RZ diagonal phase thing, this implicitly 
manipulates the singular values of the matrix. It's, it's quite it's quite hard to kind of it's not very really intuitive, but this RZ diagonal, diagonal, right? And then the signal values are diagonal. So that's the way I kind of think about it. So yeah, so this is the, the methodology to implement arbitrary matrix functions on a quantum computer because we do an implicit SVD and then we signal process the, the signal values using the quantum signal processing mentality using the combination of block encoding and signal qubit rotations. And then this is, it's, it's basically, that's it. Like for the grand unification, you can show that Grover's algorithm, Hamiltonian simulation, factoring, they can all be represented as matrix function problems. So that's that's what leads you to this grand unification is that you can now do all the matrix functions. So if you, if you can think of any cool matrix functions, you can probably come up with a new quantum algorithm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then I just, yeah, we, we can do this now in PyScript. So if you get, give it, if it, we have an operator, we can do this. Okay, and then, so this is now, if you wanted to do Hamiltonian simulation with quantum signal processing, you have to, I believe this is out of date now because I think there is a way to get around this, but for, for the purpose of completeness, I'll just say this. So, because you have to have definite parity, which basically means you have odd or even functions, the exponential function is not odd or even. So, you have to signal process the cosine part and signal process the, the sine part and then do an LCU on the hat with this handle mark here to add them together. Um, yeah, and then so that that's basically the end of my slide. End of my slides. So I hope you kind of have a grasp on how the different flavors of time evolution and how quantum signal processing can lead to the grand unification uh, techniques. I hope it's not as complicated as it seems in the papers. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you. Okay, how can how, how do you uh, implement the uh, like measuring the last hour? How do you implement it? Oh, you just yeah, good, good question. You just basically you you run all this. You just take the you you run maybe a ten thousand shots, and then you just pick the the results which have zero zero on those qubits. Yeah, and then you uh, reconstruct you that, that would just the the, the successful pre, pre, the, it's, it is a bit confusing sorry so, yeah, it's got, so this only so this circuit only works when you get the correct zero zero so it's like a successful application of the lcu only happens when you have a occurrence of this zero zero bit string. So if you think about, if you give it a set of shots through the whole circuit, you're going to get only a few of them are going to have zero zero. Yeah, so that's only the ones with zero zero on this bit string have the information applying H to the side. Yeah, does that answer your question? Wait, so if I want to contribute the circuit, uh, Yeah, you can keep going, yeah. You can't copy these. You can't copy the wave function. Yeah, so. Yeah. so it's it's not copying the wave function. The wave function is just you're applying an operator to the wave function. So it's like you can always apply operators successively to the wave function. So this is this is just a big way of applying an operator. Just yeah, exactly. Just measuring that to the the. The, the state the states register stays alive. Okay. So that, that's a very important point, is that you're not measuring that this is not measuring the LCU. This is applying the LCU to the state. So it's, the state is still present in the circuit. Yeah. So that, that really could be side dash rather than H side. Yeah. Can you do that way like uh, using uh application without measuring the 
you could, so you could do amplitude amplification and then measure the ancillary, and then you'd have a higher higher success probability. Yeah, uh, this is a fixed point. Like, yeah, yeah. So can I just go me more on the So you, you, for Grover's, you still have to measure the ancillary, but it will be a higher success probability. So like Grover's, this might be very low success probability. Okay, Grover's is a series of successive reflections and uh, like and you do the you reflect around the sphere, then it quadratically improves success probability Grover. So your the amount of times you get zero zero would be quadratically better than if you did it, but you still need to post select at the end. Okay, yeah. Questions? Thanks, uh, thanks again. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh...